This is Off Planet Radio. Radio. I'm Emily Moyer. We are an audio only today because that's the way our guest likes it. We have a returning guest today. She's one of our favorites. She is the brilliant mind. We're going to talk about these quote unquote fires that have been going on everywhere in the first hour. And then we're going to go off what I would normally think of as her usual track and dive into uh, the depths of the disco bloodbath of Studio 54 in the second hour. Sophia St- a Small Storm, welcome back to Off Planet Radio. Emily, thank you very much, and you're always very kind to say great things about me, but I'm just bumbling around. That's what I'm doing. (laughs) I learned some things about these fires, you know? I mean, I know people have very far-reaching ideas about them, but I'm going to get more into the pedestrian material, which adds up very interestingly at the end of the day. So bear with us, audience. We're not going to talk about flaming directed energy weapons necessarily, which are very possibly the case. We're going to talk about what led up to all of this. All right? All right. That sounds good. You start us at the beginning and take us through, and I'm sure I'll uh, throw in some exotic questions, you know, maybe maybe some questions about energy weapons or uh, uh, power being supplied from directional satellites in space. I think I watched a video about that or something like that. So uh, let's start where you start and see where we go and take us down the rabbit hole with you. All right, so let's start with Portugal. I didn't know at all that Portugal is the country in the world with pretty much the greatest private ownership of forests. Did you know that? I only know, I, only the other day when you told me as we pre-showed did I uh, <laughs> did I find out about that. But I have to say right off the bat, things are interesting synchronistically that you come to me with this stuff about Portugal because five of my four, something like four or five of my close people in my circle, friends, family, whatever, have been to Portugal in the last month. So isn't that weird, right? Like separately separately yeah yeah yeah. that's that's funny how that happens so let's start with portugal and tell everybody about the private ownership of forestry all right so portugal used to be about 10 percent forest and mainly pine pine trees you're going to find all over the place but back in the 1800s they brought eucalyptus trees from australia to portugal as they did to california by the way california received transplanted eucalyptus trees and we were told oh these are going to be great for construction and they they were going to make railroad ties out of them as well but they're not that good for construction so let's put california aside for now and stick with portugal portuguese people planted eucalyptus and they enlarged their forest area coverage from about 10 percent of the country to gosh, like 40%, right? And the rulers of Portugal encouraged the common people to buy little plots of land with trees, eucalyptus and pine trees. And they said this was kind of like a green savings account because every 30 to 40 years, you can harvest pines and every 10 years, eucalyptus. And there's a very lucrative paper industry in Portugal now. And the paper mills would buy the harvested trees from the regular people and they would eat all collect a few thousand euros at these intervals and that would help them out. So now let's remember that private ownership of land is what is the red flag here, right? Okay. So technically you should maintain forests. And one of the things that you need to do if you are overseeing forest maintenance, you need to thin out what's called the dog hair. And that's more of an American term, but dog hair are the little 
dense trees, the underbrush, right? Mm -hmm. And also when there's elevation, dog hair are the spindly little pines that grow up in where like where the clouds and fog gather at the top of mountains and dog hair typically retains a lot of moisture and snow. So when it's at elevation, it doesn't burn under ordinary circumstances. But in Portugal, the underbrush has not been thinned. And the result of that has been that each year, not only does the forest encroach more, the fields being taken over by the trees, but um, the Pinhal interior, it's called, interior pine forest, is just full of this underbrush that burns. Why, that, why, why, has it not, why has it not been thinned? Because people can't be bothered. Okay. I didn't know if they weren't allowed to or if it's just the people. Okay, gotcha, all right. No, it's just that I guess the peasants used to do it. This is the difference. In the old days when there were mostly farms, not many men, many forests proportionally. The peasants used to thin out the underbrush. But today we don't have peasants necessarily. We got 40% forest in Portugal and we've got regular people owning patches of land and they're not about to roll up their sleeves and go there with axes and cut down the dog, right? So that's okay. the difference. So the eucalyptus in Portugal has been extremely dangerous because now I'm gonna give a little crash course on eucalyptus. It's called eucalyptus globulus and it is a very oil rich tree and the oil really burns. In fact, they've used it as motor fuel. So you've got these woody thick leaves and these very tall trunks and anyone who lives in California sees this all the time and the tree is constantly growing. It grows very rapidly and it's always shedding its bark. And so the bark dangles in these long ribbons. You've seen that, right? Yeah. And the leaves, it's always dropping leaves. And the leaves that fall to the floor of the forest or wherever it's growing, they are very, very slow to decompose. They're full of tannins and oils and they're very flammable. Mm -hmm. So all this decortication, it's called, the bark shedding and the oily leaves, um, that bark, if there's fire, it'll blow on the wind for miles and it'll drop then and start spot fires. Okay. So eucalyptus trees are very fire prone. And when they're flanked by pine trees and dog hair, you kind of have a lot of risk going there. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to mention that when wood burns, it's not really the wood that's burning, I found. It's the gases contained in the wood. Okay. And when those gases are released completely and, burnt and combusted by the fire, the wood turns into charcoal. Mm -hmm. So a hydrocarbon wood fire starts to combust at about 300 degrees Celsius and increases to about 600 degrees, which is a little over 1,000 Fahrenheit. But charcoal will burn at 2,000 Fahrenheit, right? So that's why when you sit by the embers of your fire, in your fireplace, the charcoal still is very, very warm and releases a lot of heat. So in June 2017, there was a huge mega fire in Portugal called the Pedro Gal Grande. I'm probably pronouncing it horribly, but I don't know Portuguese pronunciation. And this was June and... Um, that fire, this is what's so weird about it, Emily. It, it burned, mega fires burn over 100,000 acres. And we used to have very few mega fires, like one every decade at, in the world. And now we have them all the time. Okay, we've got tons and tons of mega fires, way more than we should. And so our job as Sherlock Holmes is listening to this show, we're going to figure out why. So anyway, you've got Pedra Gao Grande, and there is a V-shape to that fire. There were a number of people who died. Many people attempted to flee. And I'm going to tell you that one woman in her fl fleeing ended up cooked pretty much, and she had a hardened yellow puddle next to her. And that was her gold jewelry that had melted. Ah. 
So now if we propose this to conspiracy theorists, they would immediately say, DEWs, DEO, this is, I mean, you cannot have that with a regular forest fire. But I found out that you actually can. So the melting point of gold is a little over, I'm looking for it here, um, 1947 Fahrenheit, 1064 Celsius. And charcoal reaches over 2000 Fahrenheit. So we've got a fire that was burning very, very hot. And another thing I want to point out is that fire will only go to a certain temperature, a hydrocarbon fire, okay? After that, you're going to talk in terms of kilowatts, which is the energy, the power of the fire. When you have a tiny little measly fire going in your fireplace and you have to keep blowing on it, blowing on it, it's not releasing any heat, that fire may reach a certain temperature, let's say 600 degrees Celsius, but if it's not big, it's not going to produce any worthwhile kilowatts. So you have to switch. So, so what you're saying... So what you're saying is that at a certain point, the fire becomes of a certain heat, and if it's of a certain size, it actually then becomes electric, whether there's any directed energy weapons or not. You don't need that. At a certain point, the size and the heat of the fire start to create electricity. Well, I'm talking about uh, power. Watt is a power measurement. Okay, okay, okay. okay. All right. So imagine a giant wildfire burning on the other hillside. I'm looking out my window okay. and walls of flame very high. The temperature at a certain point becomes irrelevant because it's what it is. It's a wood fire, right? Okay. But the volume of heat that it's releasing is gigantic if it's okay. a huge fire. Okay. So that's what gives it its power. Okay. And that amount of heat is what cooks people before the fire ever reaches them. Gotcha. Right? The, amount, the amount of heat. The overwhelming yes. so amount. The okay. volume of heat. Okay. So it's like saying, here's my garden hose. I've got this dribble of uh, 30 degree or whatever, it's freezing, uh, or 45 degree water coming out of it. But if I put volume through that hose, gotcha. now I have a torrent of 45 degree water coming out of it. Gotcha. And that's going to do way more damage to your plants. Uh, the power of what's coming out of that hose, regardless of the temperature, right? Okay, yeah. So, so I mean, you'll, have pre you'll have pressure injuries now as opposed to just, yeah, I got you. Okay. There's a volume issue. Yeah. A big amount of fire. So the Pedregal Grande fire started, and this is typical now, this is what they're blaming PG&E for, uninsulated power lines that at the same time, on the same afternoon, happened to ignite something in the wilderness. Okay. This was supposed. Now, I didn't even realize there's such a thing. I thought, is there such a thing, uninsulated power lines? So I look it up, and guess what? Yes. If these power lines are strung in open areas, they're not insulated. Air is considered an adequate insulator of power lines okay only when power lines run through dense woods not even scrubby woods are they insulated okay and i'm thinking that's ridiculous right but that's how it goes mm -hmm. so picture a v now in portugal in this particular area okay v and I'm talking geographically. So at the two points of the V, power lines on the same afternoon at approximately the same time ignited little fires. All right. Okay. So then what happened was um, the fire caught because it's in this untended forest area with tons of eucalyptus and all kinds of little dog hair growing, right? Right. And presumably, it's the fire started traveling. So there wasn't much wind then. This is about little after two in the afternoon. It started around 2.30 and 2.40, three o'clock. It was just catching. Okay. So now another thing we have to remember is, I'm gonna read you from this article, which was in Harper's Magazine, August, 2018. 
slope is the most important thing that determines the behavior of a wildfire. Mm. Because hot air rises, a fire on a slope preheats the fuel uphill from it. So remember what I said about volume, right? Yep. Now we're getting into kilowatts. So fires move uphill quickly and grow stronger as they move. And they accelerate more and more the farther they run. If there are any number of bad places to be in a wildfire, uphill is the worst. Ah, okay. Uh, so by 3 p.m. in Pedra Gao Grande, we had 20-foot flames. And now we get a breeze. The breeze wafts embers into the eucalyptus and pines on a nearby hill. Now you get spot fires. And they have these bombieros, they're called. Uh, bomberos or something. These are the rural firemen. They're all, um, they're all voluntary. So the bomberos or bomberos are running around trying to fight these spot fires, but they can't do much because the wind is blowing them farther than the bomberos can run. So now we've got the two fires that are approaching along this V. By six in the evening, they've burned a thousand acres, and now they're burning the crowns of trees. So the crowns on eucalyptus are very oil rich. If flames, I'm reading from the article, if flames reach this upper level, they will set off a fire of great intensity. Crown fires are the most powerful wildfires. They also tend to be the largest and fastest, in part because of another chain reaction. The winds blow stronger through the tops of trees than through their trunks. And these upper winds will help a crown fire to spread quickly from treetop to treetop while feeding it oxygen. So we've got a thousand acres gone, six in the evening. It started at 2.30. And now guess what? Now we're like the conspiracy theorists have to start banging their little tambourines. <laughs> <laughs> By sheer misfortune a thunderstorm was approaching. Right. Yeah, and we know that those things can be engineered. Right. So when, that's when the winds shifted abruptly and increased, fanning the flames and spreading them even more through the crowns. This set off what is known as a blow up. So the fire chief that was hired by the government, I believe, the fire expert, he said either the fire would have to be controlled at this time, with this storm episode, or it's irrevocably lost control of the fire. Mm -hmm. So now fires, the fires were burning so hot with such intensity and volume that water was no good. You can't use water on a fire front that's 20,000 kilowatts per meter. Okay. And that increased and increased and increased, right? Mm -hmm. So the firefighters, the bomberos, they just had to give up. And then by seven, the fire had gone through 3,000 acres and now it was moving up, moving west up the slope toward this road, which was three miles away. And the winds were just tearing through the forest. So what happened was we're going along this V. And I believe if you're gonna talk conspiracy theory, all of this was engineered. They are starting fires from power lines, which I don't believe personally, necessarily. It could have been DEWs at those points, very pinpointed, precise locations on the tips of this V. And mm -hmm. then they use all of the uh, weather and wind creating energy that they have at their disposal to keep mm -hmm. moving the fire, moving the fire toward the vortex of the V. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened. By 7.30 PM, the converging fire fronts met and they had traveled about a mile, and now they, con they created what's called a convection process. Mm -hmm. And these convection processes can be tornadoes, fire whirls, very strong suction of air coming from both sides. So now we have flames 120 feet high, drafting massive amounts of oxygen, which fans the flames more, pulls in more oxygen, and now you get at this V point, this vortex, flames that are at 60,000 kilowatts per meter. And the temperature is now that 2000 degrees. And the tree crowns are combusting like crazy in the heat. Yeah. Wow. 
Yeah. I, I, so I'm as you're telling me this, I, I'm closing my eyes because I do a, a bit of remote viewing, but I'm actually look, watching it while you're telling me. <laughs> so I just, yeah, I'm watching the V come together. It's kind of cool. For, for those of you out there who like to do vision, visionary stuff, or if you do any remote viewing, as you listen to Sophia here, close your eyes and see what you see. Yeah. Very interesting. So this fire, okay. it killed about 60 something people. Um, which is very unfortunate. It burned masses of acres. And that has become the new normal. 2017 had the driest September in Portugal, 87 years. This was a June fire, but September and October was the hottest in, a, in Portuguese history. Mm -hmm. More land burned in just October than all year. Wow. So the fire... Um, expert of the government says, if this is the new normal, I want you to think in terms of Agenda 21 and 5G, all right? If, if wildfires, wildfires, whatever they want to call them, are the new normal, then the landscape need, needs to change dramatically. And what do we do for that? We've got to remove trees, mm -hmm. treat the underbrush aggressively, and we have to impose large parcels of land without trees. Mm -hmm. And that is for the conduction of 5G, because yep. trees will block it. Mm. So yep. go, so oh, hello? Yeah, I was, I just muted myself because oh, okay. you were about to say something. No, 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 okay, no, no, go ahead. I wasn't, I, I, I wasn't going to say something, go ahead. So let's just look at this as something that happened in the country that had the most private ownership of forest in the world. Mm-hmm. And the, you know, swat on the wrist is that, okay, people, you cannot, you're not knowledgeable enough to own your own bit of forest. You're going to have to have the government taking control of the forests. Mm -hmm. And that, I mean, they're telling us in this article that it's the people of Portugal, the small farmers in particular, who don't heed government mandates on how to, to, how to behave properly right. because we've got this global warming and these fire threats. <laughs> and the, the small farmers are told, if you're going to burn, you've got to burn. You can't burn in the summer. But we learn from the article that, oh, these farmers burn in secret. And this is why the government has to take control because the landscape in Portugal is too vulnerable for the behavior of its population. Well, it, this also sounds like, if you recall from some of the things going on, like when the thing happened up in Oregon here, like people who were doing responsible backfires to keep their lots clear of this stuff, they would get in trouble for setting fires, right? So you're damned if you do and damned if you don't, right? So mm -hmm. like, it's the kind, you know, it's very, um, they're blaming the farmers in this sense, but then if the farmers went about doing those small little fires, they'd probably find a reason to bust them for that too, for clearing the underbrush, right? The little backfires that, that people who have land do to sort of prevent bigger fires. Um, but yeah, no, this is, um, I mean, it's, <laughs> I have a lot of stuff going through my mind right now. It is, we're at this place where people are so able to predict what will happen when if you do something right they know if you just smart it start a tiny little fire in these points you're talking about and then comes the wind and then comes the thunderstorm well whatever all that kind of stuff right it's almost like you know they've become masters at harnessing the environment against the people right uh when necessary and it's making me think of one of the things i'm studying a lot of sort of mm, chemistry as relates to nutrition lately and I always kind of wind all my thoughts together in some ways like you do maybe not as succinctly as you do but uh, if you think about the periodic table and the elements and things like that and then you could think that maybe like some biblical and ancient texts are really representation these gods or these powers these characters that are in these books are represented on the periodic table as as what things happen when things that shouldn't meet up meet up or when things shouldn't be combined or combined right and it's kind of like a new way of conducting war on the people is just using natural elements against them right like 
Uh, yeah, know. absolutely, Emily. And that's why, as I was reading this, now this is in a mainstream magazine. It's a very thorough magazine with thorough uh, research and writing, but it is mainstream. And it's plausible to the average person who's not aware of weather modification and the extent to which wind mm -hmm. created um, artificially and even thunderstorms and such. They wouldn't ever dream that this could be engineered this yeah. could be with with tree lines uh, sorry power lines falling on trees at the same time on the same afternoon and then all this stuff that happened wasn't just pure coincidence Pe most people are not capable of having that understanding. So it's the, it goes the same like with nutrition. They think that the reason our food has uh, degraded is just by coincidence or people's tastes have changed or whatever. When no, it's you know something that can be um, maneuvered along intentionally to look natural, but is really being engineered that way, right? Um, it's the same thing. Uh, I just this idea, this artificial wind, it's one of those things that like, I've obviously been aware of weather modification and created weather for a long time, but I've always looked at it more through the lens of like, uh, fires, storms, things with the chemtrails, blah, 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 blah. But uh, when the fires happened here last fall in, in uh, Thousand Oaks and Malibu and Chatsworth and all that kind of stuff, I, for the first time experience, I hadn't really thought about artificial wind before. It just, it does, I, my mind just hadn't done that exercise yet, but I was outside of my place of work taking the trash out and I felt this gust of wind and in, in my mind instantly, I'm like, that was not a natural wind. The area that I grew up in here, Los Angeles is very windy. So I've felt all different kinds of winds. I'm aware of what Santa Ana's feel like, what the usual fall winds feel like and whatnot. This felt different. What this felt like was, uh, have you ever been to like the large Bloomingdale's in New York or any of those sort of old, old school style department stores and they have those turnstile doors, right? And sometimes it'll close really quickly and it'll have this gust of wind that just moves you quickly. You know what I mean? It kind of felt like that. And I had never felt wind that felt quite like that, quite measured in that same way before. And instinctively, I knew that this was uh, artificial, artificial wind, you know, GMO wind, if you, <laughs> or whatever, if you would. Um, so yeah, I think. Yeah, that, it's yeah, amazing. I know exactly what you're talking about. And I'll tell you, we had our power shut down recently for 28 hours, which was mm -hmm. nothing compared to a friend who called last night from the Sierra foothills in Northern California and they lost power for a week. And these are all preventive measures and we're gonna get into that. Mm -hmm. But our, we were told by our utility that in certain areas, um, the power was gonna be shut down because of the wind, because they didn't want these uninsulated power lines to fall down onto trees. We've had drought, et cetera, et cetera. So finally it happened. And I'll tell you something, Emily, <laughs> we had no wind until one night at 9 p.m. suddenly we get wind. And I'm thinking, what? And the wind went from 9 p.m. to 10.30, an hour and a half. I guess that was their budget, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking, well, wait a minute. Santa Ana's don't start at night. Santa Ana's start in the morning because it's mm -hmm. the sun that creates the wind. It's a desert wind. Mm -hmm. it, the desert is two, three hours away from here. The desert has heated up, and so the wind starts in California, usually at about 9 a.m., because that's when the desert is good and hot, but not at 9 at night. Right. So I want to get into... It more. usually starts in the mid... When I, my experience of Santa Ana winds is it usually starts mid-morning, right, or, or, or midday at the latest, you know, and, and, and these are different winds than most people experience. These actually go from inland out as opposed to from the ocean in. So people who aren't familiar with Santa Ana winds... Um, that's kind of what happens, wouldn't you agree? Yeah, and they're very hot, very dry winds. Yeah. They blow offshore instead of onshore. But, but I want to get into Montana because the second article in this double feature in Harper's was about Missoula, Montana. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. It's M-I-S-S-O-U-L-A. -S 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 I would pronounce it Missoula, but I know people there and they all pronounce Missoula. it. Missoula. It's kind of like the Berkeley of Montana. It's like a hippie, weird, you know, or like what Berkeley used to be. It's kind of that artsy, fartsy college town. Whatever. But I, yeah. I, mean, I didn't know much about it until I read a little more and I know people who live there now. Anyway, so again, 2017. This was the year that birthed the 
fires. Yes. All over. Yep. So we have smoke filled skies swarming with helicopters over the Lolo National Forest. And that is a place in Montana where 99 fires ignited in the summer of 2017. Wow. So the big mega fire was at Rice Ridge. And that took out 160,000 acres in the Bob Marshall National Wilderness. Now, I looked up what's the difference between national forest and national wilderness. And the forest is thicker. It's more like forest. But the wilderness is more scrubby. And there's a big kind of mixture of different kinds of land there. But the federal government has control in the West over a lot of these regions that they term federal wilderness areas or federal yeah. So also, we've had these mild winters, and now insects, in particular the pine beetle, have survived the winters, and they're, they've been busy killing more trees. So another problem in Montana is the 10 a.m. rule. This was the result of a huge fire in 1910 that spread from Idaho to Montana. So after the 1910 fire, they had a new regulation that all forest fires must be put out by 10 the next morning after they begin to burn. That's the 10 a.m. rule. These are the forest fires that people do to the back the fires to control the brush. These are any kind of fire that's discovered. All fires now, according to the 10 a.m. rule of the Forest Service, have to be put out by 10 the next morning. They shouldn't be allowed to burn out. And many fires do Got burn it. out. Okay. So, What's happened is this 10 a.m. rule has produced a glut of trees in the Rockies, the Sierras, and the Cascades. These are all mountain ranges. And these trees now are all dying from overcrowding. So mm. here's where we have to remember that what you think of the forest, what you see in pictures and you see people hiking, these long, tall, very tall, big trees. These are at low elevations and they're mainly pines and fir. And some of these trees are decades or even two, 300 years old. Mm -hmm. But at the higher elevations, you'll find the tangled little trees that are called the dog hair. Mm -hmm. And that's different kinds of pine and fir. And they are very fire resistant under normal conditions because they hold moisture. But even now, the, even the dog hair is 80% dead because we've had all this drought and all the, the weather that was supposed to, the storms that were supposed to dump snow and rain on the Western United States through weather modification have been shunted to the Eastern and Midwest United States where they are producing all these floods, right? And tons of rain. Yeah. So the Western United States has ended up dry as bone and that is the birthplace of this new uh, mutant thing called wildfire. Okay. So, to, well, you mentioned people. And today, people do not want fires to burn. They want them put out by the Forest Service. This is what our tax dollars are for. Get busy. Put the fire out. The Forest Service has allowed certain fires to burn experimental, experimentally in limited wilderness areas. And that's when the landscape's resilience begins to return. Native trees yep. start to come back. And then when you do get fire, the fire that burns less intense, but that's no good today. All these, you know, these hyper-conscious people, environmentally conscious, they want the fires put out. This mm -hmm. is what you exist for, the Forest Service. This is what we pay you for. You got to put the fires out. Now I'm going to introduce a new term that I learned, and this is why our power was shut, and the power of a lot of people in Marin County and certain outlying areas, areas that surround the suburbs. They're called WUIs. It rhymes with GUI. Yeah. And it's an acronym, W U I, WUI, and it stands for Wildland Urban Interface. Yeah. So. Wildland Urban Interface, I'm reading from the article of Harper's 2018 August, it designates the edge of forests or other wild areas accessible enough for people to build houses. Such places host much of the West's rapid growth in residential construction despite the peril, which is offset by factors such as cheaper land, open space, wildlife, distance from neighbors, building inspectors, and assorted regulations. 
So the wooey is where people in the West like to build their houses because they don't want, they want views of wildlife and they want no building codes. They don't want too much restriction. And they want, they want space. The elbow room. And they what? want space, yeah. They want room, yeah. Right. However, since 2000, the WUI only constitutes 15% of the total area burned in the West. But the vast majority of the national fire budget, emergency fire budget, is used on this 15%. So the WUI is sucking the federal fire budget. Mm -hmm. And we are told that by the authorities, they're saying, now, wait a minute, we are not going to spend our entire fire budget on a handful of houses owned by people who, against all sane advice, choose to build in the path of catastrophe. So between 1990 and 2010, in that 20 year period, 2 million new homes were built in the WUI. Mm -hmm. So now, Fire, as we learned from this article, fire is now a social problem, Emily. <laughs> of course. <laughs> fire, so this is a, so fire is now the new weapon of Tavistock. <laughs> right. And fighting fire is a social process which will require enforced contractual terms. So are you telling me that when we're done fighting about race? then all the, all the fat girls with pink hair are going to be standing in the middle of the street screaming about how unfair it is that we have to deal with fires? Yes. <laughs> so what they're suggesting is that the feds should refuse to send firefighters into any county that hasn't taken the proper preventive measures, which would be zoning regulations on house placement, building materials selected properly, not cheap building materials, thinning how out the houses, no dense, you know, building, access roads, and so forth. So all of these can be promulgated and enforced at the county level. So this is going to mean, so people who want to live out like that, then people who live in the inner city are going to start to claim that it's socially unjust for people to live out there because it takes their tax dollars to fight the fires when their large houses burn. So it's going to become part of social economic justice. To not let it's people not just the tax dollars. It's that houses in the WUI will catch fire because they're next to the wilderness areas. Right. And houses in the WUI have been built with cheap materials. Ah. And they are endangering houses in the suburbs because the WUI is near the suburbs. Right. So. Gotcha. So they're yeah. endangering the suburbs and also they're damaging the environment because they're. Yeah. Okay. These these selfish people are putting yeah. smart, preventive-oriented people at risk and their property. So the, the free people are putting the slaves at risk, I got you. Right. Yeah, okay. So here's the analysis for Santa Rosa. I thought this was amazing from the Harper's article. Last year, 2017, because this was written in 2018, 9,000 structures burned in the fires around Santa Rosa and more than 1,000 around Los Angeles. That's what you were referring to. Okay. These were unprecedented numbers and most of the victims committed no sin to merit this level of punishment. Agreed. Okay. Nevertheless, a video clip from Santa Rosa makes a case for severe action. A reporter for NBC is in front of a charred foundation that was once a home. The scene looks as you might ex expect, as long as you don't look at the backdrop, a fringe of still green trees. Fire scientists have collections of such images, the aftermath of fires that level entire subdivisions but leave the trees standing and green. Now get this. The flames are hot enough to ignite building materials, but not the surrounding flora. These are not forest fires. They're subdivision fires running house to house, fueled by bad choices in shingles. Mm -hmm. Wow. So they call this ladder fuel. So 30% of the houses that burned in one of the Santa Rosa fires were outside the wooey. They weren't in the woods. They weren't. In, they were in cities. They were urban, and they were set alight. We're told by burning houses that were in the wooey. Wooey, right? So fire scientists speak of ladder fuels, which carry fire from one level to the next. In this yeah. case, Santa Rosa, this part of Santa Rosa, 
Thousands of irresponsibly built homes were the latter fuel that destroyed houses situated in otherwise safe areas. So now they're going to say the building materials that are responsible, those are going to be expensive. So people aren't going to be able to afford those. Therefore, they'll have to move into the little shoebox glass apartment in the city where all of that is available to you at a cheaper price because those homes are also smart. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So this is the new thing. The new thing is, okay, you people, you get, don't get to choose your building materials. You should not be choosing your areas where you want to build because all you're doing is endangering the other people. And it's exactly like the vaccine thing yeah. where they're saying people who are vaccinated keep everybody safe. People who aren't vaccinated endanger everybody. This is the upside down thinking. So now to me, Building smart is the vaccination against wildfire uh -huh. because fire is the virus that, is, that has mutated out of climate change. <laughs> yeah. Those are my words. That's the way yeah. I, I... Oh, yeah, yeah. that's exactly... But I mean, that, but that's exactly right. You know, and I, I, while you were talking about just a few minutes back, you were talking about how when the trees are too many and too close together, they, they start to die from overcrowding, right? So, out of, you know, the same thing is, you know, it's, it's funny that this connection between this situation with the trees and humanity is also going to lead to people moving into overcrowded situations, which is going to be on at least some level, even if it's just spiritually and energetically, the death of them, right? Right. The trees this, are kind of like people, and just like they're using us as weapons against one another, they're using the trees as weapons against nature through this controlled weather. And, and, and this is, I mean, <laughs> it's like the microcosm, macrocosm kind of thing, right? Now, I'm going to bring up some things that I've observed. So I really want to hang on to this term, wooey. We yeah. all should start talking about it. Okay. Because right now, wooey designates the outlying parts of civilization that border on wild undeveloped land, or let's yeah. just call it undeveloped land. Okay. And so the houses in the Wui, I live in a Wui. I live on a 13 acre wildlife preserve. And yes, I have views of deer and bobcats and owls, and I don't hear much traffic and I'm endangering everybody else. But unfortunately, our, well, fortunately our Wui, where, where we live, we're flanked by a lagoon and we have, um, we're not near dense suburbia particularly. Mm -hmm. So we're more rural, mm -hmm. but regardless, the wooey is going to be a red flag. Don't you mm -hmm. dare try to build in the wooey, you know? And I believe wooey will become a term that describes all suburbs eventually because suburbs mm -hmm. will be too close to the wooey yep. for safety. Yep. So we're all going to end up in cities that have like, you know, waterway bridges that take us to them. So that we're like having a moat around us to protect us from the nature, but or protect the nature from us or whatever it is. Right. That's kind of the idea is to move everybody into a tiny little circle. Into stack and pack. That's probably yeah. just made right out of asbestos. But listen to this. So I watched on television a few weeks ago, no, a few days ago, a week or so ago, a house burning in the Sepulveda Basin. And it was like a McMansion type thing. It was big. Yeah. And the reporter had the gall to say, so a fire like this, which is not burning the trees, okay? It's just burning the house. This is created by an ember that drifts into the house on the wind. Yep. And it just sets the whole house on fire from within mm -hmm. because of the building materials. Get it? Yeah, this is interesting, Sophia. Last year, when the fires were happening in Chatsworth, because I had some interesting connections to that. I, I was raised in that area, and there were some interesting things going on at that time. I went down a rabbit hole about these fires, and I haven't looked at the material lately, but I, I do a lot of my rabbit hole diving. Like, I use a combination of detective work, but also a lot of just, like, inner intuition and dowsing and things like that to decide which way I'm going to go with the research. And I ended up on this, uh, going down this rabbit hole of something called Project Ember, 
right? And, and it is related to this kind of thing. Um, and there, I think there's, there was a project I called Blue Blaze and a project called Ember. Um, and this is kind of like a combination of like uh, these technologies that we've been talking about, right? Like certain kinds of uh, weather engineering technologies, gaming, psychic abilities, and um, simulated reactions to things, right? Um, so it's interesting that you're talking about this particular kind of ember. I mean, I'm sure you've heard, you've heard about the smart embers, the programmed embers and stuff like that, right? I don't know too much about that, no, Emily. So yeah, to... smart embers, they're almost, I can't remember. Yeah, I think a lot of Freeland has talked about it. Maybe it wasn't her, who was it that was talking about this? But it's basically, um, embers that seek out certain things, right? Like kind of like a heat seeking missile. Oh, okay. Right. Well, yeah, no, that that's entirely possible. Yeah. Uh, they're not going to explain this to the general public. And I want to just read you a concluding uh, line or two from the author of this piece on Montana fires. Mm -hmm. This is kind of unbelievable. Wilderness has a better grasp of global warming than we do. Yeah. <laughs> Wilderness has no reasoning, no wishes, no preferences. Instead, it deploys death and fire to prepare the way for whatever is to come. Wow. So they are using fire methodology, mm -hmm. artificial fire methodology, to do population dislocation and population mm -hmm. concentration. And human choices will be punished. This is part of all of technocracy and agenda yep, yep, yep. 2030. Human choice is not the way to plan anything because humans just are in denial or they don't know enough or they can't see the, the forest for the trees. And I want to mention here the smart meter issue and draw some attention to a service that I can provide. I do have uh, some suspicion that these houses that ignite from within do not ignite because embers drifted in on the wind and they were key building materials. I do believe that it's very possible that a giant voltage spike is deployed through the smart meter. Mm -hmm. I watched a video that was uh, part of the investigation team was someone I know personally who had gone to Paradise and Santa Rosa and found that the houses that were left standing all had analog meters. Mm -hmm. Um, versus the ones that had burned had smart meters. So yeah. I think what happens is the power company at its whim puts a giant surge through the grid and the smart meters, I want everybody to really understand this, smart meters I found out not that long ago are not grounded. The analog meter has no. a three inch yeah. copper ground bar yeah. that attaches to the ground of your house, but the smart meter is totally ungrounded. So for people who don't have an opt-out or who are living with smart meters, I'm actually authorized uh, with a company, uh, an electrical engineering company, to sell their um, power box that wires into your electrical panel. And this thing, it's not cheap, but if you own a house or you care about your possessions, this thing will sacrifice itself should there be a giant voltage spike ah. and it will save your house and it has a 10-year warranty on it so in the event that a surge or a spike comes in of that degree and the unit sacrifices itself to save you and your house yeah. you get a replacement for free so it's over a thousand dollars and you would have to contact me personally for this and I, I am trained now in how to choose the proper unit and how to train people and educate them as to what this really does. Um, so it also is a whole home um, harmonic rectifying system. Oh, so wow. if you take out your dirty electricity, it will level everything out and put a lot less wear and tear on your appliances. So for people who have possessions of value that are electronic or a house that they want to hang on to and they don't want it to burn to a crisp, I would recommend contacting me um, and you can use my uh, website, my store, avatarproducts.com, the contact, the information there. 
We'll link that. We'll link that your your both your blog website and your products website in the description for the show. Yeah. Um, so I mean, once I realized that, I thought, okay, great. This is a, a very important selling point for people who live in these wooly areas. Yeah. Um, and you know, here's the. I'd like you to help me think through this. They shut the power off, and mm -hmm. they teach us to live without power, which was kind of sucky, I must say. Mm -hmm. I had to take an ice cold shower and wash my hair in ice cold water, which was not pleasant because mm -hmm. I, I, I don't have a tank water heater, but people who have tank water heaters, you can get water for a couple of days still. Mm -hmm. um, but then I'm wondering, all right, so theoretically, if they turn the power off in your area, then a downed electrical line will not affect trees that are growing, right? Mm hmm but at their whim, they can start a fire somewhere and then they can start what I call a ridge fire. Mm -hmm. And so you know there's a fire burning. And then I think what they do is they deploy their voltage surge. This is only a theory through mm -hmm. the electrical grid. They might just turn it on fast enough or send one surge through it or something, even though your power is off. I don't know how this works. Mm -hmm. And this is how they target the houses individually and they save the trees. Okay. So this is what, so these are the things that have been coming to me as you've been talking here. Well, first, what you're saying is rather than an ember, it could be these power surges. I think that's certainly possible. But I also know because of the way a lot of these other things work, that it could be both. It could be that, that these embers are deployed and then these these surges are done and that's how they're kind of selective in which areas in 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 how how the thing is burned right so it could be just the surge or it could be the combination of the ember and the surge and uh, if these embers particularly are controlled if there's some kind of smart ember or nanotechnology or something like that that goes into plays even better into the theory um I, where I live in Los Angeles, there was these supposedly all these blackouts in Southern California as well. I think I lived close enough in that, that I wouldn't be in the area that would be damaged by that. Like where I used to live, that may have been, but I think I'm just, even though I'm in kind of a suburb, I'm close enough in. Um, I think uh, I'm imagining little Greta Thunbergs running around uh, calling people wooey deniers instead of, you know, like climate deniers or whatever, right? Like I'm imagining all of these things that this could become. Have you heard the term, I, you hear this sometimes with like Bernie Sanders and a few other people uh, talking about climate justice. Like there was a, there was a, some people were even saying like a lot of these refugees from like the Middle East and Syria, they were referring to them as climate refugees, right? And that cl climate change was responsible for ISIS. So like these, all these vast sort of social um, terms and pressures, uh, I see it going there with this kind of thing. Fire is going to be the new, I think you're right. Fire is going to be the new thing that way. Um, yeah, I, I, the other thing, Sophia, is I think that these people who are deploying things like directed energy weapons and whatnot, like they also have uh, plenty of access to Tesla style technology, to free energy devices. And so they can surge those power boxes, whether or not the electricity is on. Yeah, you could be exactly right. That's why I wanted to kind of brainstorm it with you. But I know that they definitely want to level the, to eradicate from America, the whole principle concept of single family own house ownership. You know, oh, absolutely. The I, I, yard, and they, they're going to be, Maybe it's, let me just finish this thought. Yeah. Maybe it's a, there's a sequence of planning here, but I think they want to take out single family homes, whether they're in the WUI or in the suburbs, and they want to put up multiplexes for immigrants yep. who are used to living in concentrated quarters. You know? Totally. I mean, yeah. all, all around here, we're getting new apartment buildings that have businesses on the bottom. So I think the idea is going to be stack them, pack them in, and let them work in the Starbucks that's underneath there. Right, and this way they never have to leave their home, so they're not using cars or even public transportation. Right, so it's basically creating dormitories for people to stay in while they work at their slave jobs for you know fifteen dollars an hour or whatever. Right, um, 
I think also, uh, Sylvia, I'm going to suggest you and the listeners go watch the video. You can find videos of these uh, Tesla technology that's being experimented with in a place called Milford, Texas. We were just on a trip and we went, we kind of examined these things and it's, it, it's kind of interesting the way that they're saying this works, that you can basically send target, targeted electricity from one of these towers to any location in the world, right? That location doesn't necessarily have to have wired electricity. You can just send spurt of power. Um, I forget the name of the company that's doing it, but if you just look up Tesla Tower in Milford, Texas, you'll see what I'm talking about. And, and I think something like this could be sort of what's being deployed here. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think <laughs> as usual, Sophia, I think you're right. And I like the way you start us with the story of private ownership of forests in Portugal, right? And wrap us all the way around to what's happening here. You know what I mean? Like you take us from the entrance to the rabbit hole to the bottom. Um, and yeah, thank you. I mean, I just happen, it's wild. This is why I think there is some kind of higher force here in our lives, but mm -hmm. we had this power outage. So what am I doing? I can't use the computer. I sit on the floor of my room in a sunny spot because I couldn't really use any heat either. And I drank my cup of tea, which I have a gas stove so I can make tea. And I'm thinking, all right, let me just catch up on some magazine reading. And I grabbed this Harper's issue, August, 2018. I thought, okay, it's only a, a year and a few months that I haven't read this one. And there's this double feature on fire. Yeah. Wildfire. So I start reading and I go, oh my God, private ownership of forests. Mm -hmm. People aren't cleaning up the underbrush. We have to take it away from them. The government has to manage. The government has to remove trees. And the, the people are too reckless and irresponsible to be allowed to continue to own private land like this. And then I read about the wooey and I looked out the window and I went, my God, that's where I live in a wooey. Well, what's interesting, Sophia, is, you know, the governments, governments or the powers that be or the corporations, however you choose to look at it, long ago took away our ownership of ourselves legally, right? And most people don't know that. And what they allowed us to have instead was stuff, uh, houses, cars, all these kinds of things. And so people came to identify who they were with what they had. And now they're ready for step two, which is to take away people's, the things that people own so that they don't have anything. Not only do they not own items, but they already don't own themselves. So they've been people, Americans in particular, but really anyone in the West has been possessed by their things that they own for a really long time. Not that we shouldn't be allowed to own stuff, but the most important thing for us to own is ourself, right? And people gave that up knowingly or unknowingly a long time ago and have failed to, for some reason, be able to understand that. You know, now you and I both know that sort of energetically and spiritually, once you become aware of this, you can take back ownership of yourself by the things you choose to associate yourself with and whatnot. But most, that's a, a faraway land for most people. So now the things that people have that they see as their identity, that's going to start being stripped back to, to the point where you're just a bot living in a tomb in a city that goes to work at your $15 an hour job so you can afford to go home and get some rest and come back to work the next day. I mean, that's that. It's basically, you know, the point they're shrinking everything in right they're pulling everything um you know people are going to get to the point where they're happy as long as they have their phone and their computer they're happy but they're, they don't even own that either like if people don't even own their phones they 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 have a contract with the phone the cell phone company right and and basically they're leasing the phone just sometimes people will buy their phone separately but then it relies on service from an outer company so they're going to get people to the place where they only, as long as they can experience the rest of the world through their phone, they think they have a life, but they don't even own that phone. <laughs> you know what well, I mean? Even more than the ownership, Emily, is something I wrote about in the newsletter that I wrote about technocracy. And by the way, just for the listeners, I encourage you if you want to keep up with me. I laugh when I say that, but um, I put this, the information, the rabbit holes that I am diving into and the things that I'm threading together do get written up in my private newsletter. And this is not posted online. I have some back issues on my blog website 
that you can read, but I do radio shows on the newsletters periodically, but the best is just to subscribe and it's by, you have to pay for it. Sorry, but this, I have to live and um, you get to be a subscriber. And then that gives you a, the privilege of talking to me a little bit too. And again, I use that word privilege in quotes, but <laughs> my newsletter people are fantastic. I love my subscribers and I'm happy to talk to them and write emails back and forth. And, um, yeah, the newsletter, the newsletters are fantastic guys. They, they really are a worthwhile expenditure. And, um, yeah, it, it is. It, and sometimes you start reading the newsletter and you're like, where is she going with this? And then by the end, you're like, how did you just tie those things together? But you did. And so I encourage people to sign up for the newsletter. It's a very worthwhile, uh, do, you know, donation and whatnot. And, uh, uh, Visit her blog and, and, and her product site. There's lots of good stuff there. Sophia, before we wrap this hour up, do you have anything else you want to say that, to kind of wind this one around? Yes, I'm going to be getting into my store a bunch of the proper, the only good LED light bulbs on the planet. These produce no harmonics. They don't produce dirty electricity. They're very, very clean, and they're full spectrum with a lot of infrared. And the shipment just came in, so... They are, I don't, we didn't go into this, but it's another product from this company that I'm associated with now, this wonderful engineering company. So those will be on the site imminently because I've just been told I have my enormous order that I place coming through. So if you want, um, you know, it's harder to get incandescence and this, this is a very good LED, very good. No distortion, no dirty electricity, full spectrum, heavy on the, uh, yellow and infrared. All right. Okay, guys, very good. That wraps up the first hour. Please join us over on patreon.com forward slash off planet media for the second hour where we were, we are going to go knee deep into drugs and disco dancing. We'll see you on the other side. Thanks, Sophia. This is off planet radio. Thank you.